I have our soil test results from the soil test that we ran a couple of weeks ago and I decided it'd be time to head back to the extension and check in with our friend Beth Finley about interpreting the results. Hi Beth. Hi Tracy. All right, let's see what we have here. What have we got? Okay. Have you read a soil test result before? I have not, but okay. David, my husband, has read many because he's an agronomist. Okay. So he would be familiar with all those. Correct. These tests are not extremely difficult, but they can be confusing at first glance for people who haven't seen them before. So there are basically four areas that you'll see listed here. The soil nutrient levels, mm -hmm. and that's simply this bar graph, mm -hmm. which is a graphic summary of the laboratory results. Okay. Then secondly are the recommendations, and this is the key to the test. This is the part you really want to zero in on. Okay. These recommendations, which are specific to the crop that you've told Penn State you're going to grow. So in your case, uh, you've told them you're growing mixed vegetables, and these recommendations are specific for your vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, there are messages, and you want to take those quite seriously because they define exactly how you're going to apply the amendments that they've recommended. I see. And then lastly are the laboratory results at the bottom, and this is an area that's often confusing to people. <laughs> Because I say. <laughs> you can imagine Back to high why. school chemistry. <laughs> right. All kinds of laboratory results and numbers and abbreviations and things that most of us just don't use day to day. Okay. Even if we once had it in chemistry, <laughs> this is not something we're familiar with. Fortunately, you really can ignore those laboratory results uh -huh. at the bottom. Now, David perhaps would be interested and enthralled by that, right. <laughs> but most of us are not. You can ignore that because uh -huh. all of those um, laboratory readings have already been incorporated for you into the recommendations. I see. So that's okay. done for you. Okay. That's just for those chemists who really enjoy seeing the raw data. Got it. Okay. So what we're going to concentrate on most is the recommendations and those messages about the recommendations. Okay. But a word about the bar graph. This is handy because it's a very graphic representation of what they've discovered about your soil. It's an easy visual it is. to interpret. So at a quick glance you can see that your pH is right in the middle of the optimum range. That's great. It's not going to have to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. You can see again easily that phosphate is high, potash, the potassium is even higher, um, magnesium is high, calcium is a little high. So that gives you a clue already as to what the re recommendations are likely to be. Okay. <laughs> so you're not going to be adjusting soil pH. Right. But you may be balancing other things. Okay. Now it's important to know when you look at this bar graph that when they say optimum, they've taken these soil test results, these numbers from the bottom, mm -hmm. and they're saying this is optimum for vegetables. Right. If you had told them that you were using the same soil to grow blueberries, this soil pH would not be optimum. So it's critical to list on your soil test exactly what you want, exactly. what, you're, what you're hoping to grow. Right. And to remember when you come back to this soil test that these values pertain to your vegetables, not to any other crop. Got it. Okay. Got it. Now a question that often comes up is what does it matter if it's above optimum? Mm -hmm. Well, in some cases it doesn't matter, but it may because to grow plants successfully, you need not only the proper pH and the presence of certain nutrients, but the balance between those nutrients is critical. Okay. Because if you have too much of some, they may prohibit uptake of some of the others. So you not only have to have them there, but you have to have them in some sort of reasonable balance. Sure, sure. You and I are usually not going to know what that balance is. But again, these recommendations have accounted for them. Got it. Got okay. It. Now, Beth, would there ever be um, would there ever be a possibility that your soil is too fertile? How how would you know? Well, fertility is an, um, a difficult term. Fertility would mean the ability of the soil to grow plants. 
So in the literal sense, no, it couldn't be too fertile. Okay. But it could be excessive in certain elements. Throwing off the balance that you were just talking exactly. about. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And would there ever be cause to take more than one soil test? There could be. For the same plot? plot. There definitely could be. And there would be two scenarios where that might be the case. Mm -hmm. So here you've taken soil from your vegetable garden uh -huh. and you've sampled that. We can go through in a minute how that's done. Um, but you have sent this sample in and they've given you a reading and recommendations pertinent to your vegetables. Right. But let's say that you took that very same soil from your garden and in one corner of the garden you wanted to grow blueberries which have a very different sort of need sure. than most of the vegetables. Then you might want to do a separate soil test in that corner and now you'd send in the sample, same sample, uh -huh. but you would identify blueberries as your target Specify crop. Specify it on, on the right. paperwork. And if you did that, presumably the results of the analysis would come back exactly the same as they are here, right. but the recommendations could be quite different for sure. a different crop. Sure. So in that case you have the same soil over a broad area, but because you're doing, doing two different kinds of crops, you would do two tests. Got it. Got it. The other circumstance would be, let's say you have a suburban lawn, but you have reason to think that the soil is different across that lawn. Perhaps mm -hmm. there's a low area where there's a spring, uh -huh. or a high um, embankment that's very shaly where the rest of the soil seems to be clay. Okay. For whatever reason, perhaps something was imported or something was stripped off, uh, or just geologically, you right. have two different areas. In that case, even if you were growing, let's say, grass over the whole area, you would do two separate soil tests because you have reason to think you have two different kinds of soil right. and the analysis would be different for those two, even though the crop is the same. Sure. But again, the recommendations could be different because to get the, say, the swampy area into good condition for grass, mm -hmm is a different process than getting the high dry area into perfect condition for grass. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes. Now, Beth, I read that wood ash is very alkaline. Would you recommend that as a good substitute for lime? Wood ash would accomplish the same thing, but there are two difficulties. One is, first of all, the wood ash has to be quite clean. That is, it can't be from treated lumber or painted, varnished lumber, anything like that, because of course you'd be introducing some of those uh, toxic materials then into your garden soil, which you don't want to do. If it is clean, natural wood ash, that is an acceptable amendment for soil, but I would say in small quantities. The other difficulty is that without a soil test, you don't know whether you need that liming or ash material, and you have no way of knowing how much ash the value of the Penn State test is that they tell you exactly how much lime to put on. I see. Now one thing you could do if you have wood ash available is to apply it very lightly, say every six months or every year. I wouldn't put huge amounts in. But then you would con continue to soil test so that you know where that pH level is and you know if you need any more amendment or not. I see. Good point. So Beth, if you're faced with multiple problems, shall we say, for your plot, but you have a limited budget, how do you make it all work? Okay. And you're referring to, to multiple recommendations Correct. on your soil test kit. Correct. First of all, the amendments recommended will almost always be relatively inexpensive, so okay. hopefully that won't be a problem. But if it comes to not correcting the soil, versus planting. Yes. I would put off the planting. The investment in your soil is the underpinning of your whole endeavor. And if that soil isn't right, you're going to have problems all the way down the road. Sure. Now, let's say you already have an existing lawn and it turns out that it needs some adjustment. That crop is already there. You can gradually introduce those adjustments over time and get away with that. But say in a vegetable garden where you want a good, vibrant, abundant crop all in a few months, yeah. I'd spend the time and money to get the soil right, right up front. 
Are there considerations other than fertility when planting a garden, a vegetable garden? Absolutely. There are, there's one major consideration just in the soil. Let's talk about that first. Uh -huh. The structure of the soil is critical. Not only those nutrients and pH, that's a very good start, but if the structure of the soil doesn't have pore space in it, that is empty space that can be filled either with air or water, or mm -hmm. ideally both, mm -hmm. then the roots can't get out and can't collect those nutrients. So the structure of the soil is terribly important. And the best way to improve the, the structure of the soil is with organic amendments. Peat moss, compost, um, manures, all those natural organic ingredients. Okay. And those are not very high in nutrients, but they improve the structure so much that they make nutrients more available. So indirectly, they do increase the fertility of the soil. Oh, great to know. So that's the other soil consideration, along with actually having those nutrients there. Another big thing is to situate your garden in the right place. If you're growing vegetables, for instance, you need six to eight hours at least of bright, hot sun every day. So you can't get away really with putting a vegetable garden in the shade. Mm. That pertains to all other plants too. One of the prime principles in gardening is to get the right plant in the right place. And that means the proper zone, sun shade, uh, wet, dry, whether or not it can survive with windy conditions, all of those parameters have to be considered. Got it. How often should I retest my garden or fields? We say at least every three years. And it depends a lot on what you're doing. Vegetables take more out of the soil mm. than, say, a maturing tree that's going to have a very long, slow growth pattern. So for vegetable gardens, I would say no more than three years between tests, and possibly even two if you're turning over vegetables at a good rate. Okay, now let's say after all of this, I still have some questions, or something about the results is just not making sense. What do I do? You have an easy recourse for that. Your local extension office, your cooperative extension office in your county, has a site available to the educators in that office at the university. When the university mails you this hard copy of your soil test mm -hmm. results, they also post it on that limited site. But your educator in the local extension office can get to that site and bring that form up. So if you call their office and give them a little bit of warning to bring that up on their screen, right. the two of you can be seeing the same thing and discussing those results live. Super. Again, if you have any questions about your soil test or anything else going on in your yard or garden, don't hesitate to call your local cooperative extension. It's a fabulous resource. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Tracy.